Good morning, everyone. Um, well, we'll go ahead and get started. I know we have uh, Commissioner Layden online. Commissioner, do you want to kick us off with a welcome? Good morning. Yes, I'd be pleased to welcome everybody to the June 13th, 2024 Douglas County Homeless Initiative. Uh, I made it to my gate at DIA, and I will tell you the A gate is great. So <laughs> we, we finally sat down, but uh, my daughter graduated from high school, and so we're taking her on a little trip, but uh, no doubt wanted to uh, really welcome everybody to the homeless initiative today. As one of only two counties in the entire state that has reduced overall homelessness, I think um, it's a proud thing for this uh, initiative to, to speak about and work on. Um, what you might notice is a real desire from the county to go from 2.0 to 3.0 of the homeless initiative. And, and much of today will be about reviewing current practices, where, whether it's the HEART team or the Handouts Don't Help campaign, um, all of the work that you all have been contributing to over um, the last few years, frankly, with regard to this homeless initiative, and how we can improve upon those particular programs that have been working so well. Um, I think the big theme is we're not going to rest on our laurels. And the big, hairy, audacious goal is we want to get to as close to functional zero by that point in time count in July as we possibly can. Um, I know Rand, Jen, law enforcement, the HART team, all of you in the nonprofit community, all of our partners, uh, our municipal partners uh, have been so valued in this exercise. Um, specifically with the HART team, I, I think what has been really uh, quite special about the heart team is the fact that it's this is not um, an endeavor of the behavioral sciences and it's not an endeavor of uh, necessarily law enforcement it's both um, and it's each profession respecting one another really well out in the field obviously we've expanded to five teams and more hiring is is happening uh, right now as I understand it so really excited uh, and, and wanting to hear more about how uh, we all will be operating to get to that functional zero number. So thank you for joining us today. I'll turn it back to Jen. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Um, we are going to, we have a very special uh, um, presentation today. So we are at the point with our Douglas Has Heart uh, fund where we are going to be able to do our fourth contribution today. Mike, did you want to talk a little bit about that? And then I'm going to ask Diane to come up from Parker Task Force um, to give us a, a little bit of information about Parker Task Force and share a little bit of, of the work that you do. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Jen. Just to give everyone a quick update of, of where we're at with this fund and what the actual fund is just as a reminder for everyone. Uh, the Douglas County Community Foundation is honored to partner with Douglas County uh, for the, as the, the fund holders for the Douglas Has Heart Fund. This fund is something that was specifically created to kind of serve two purposes. One is to encourage folks that are out on the street who wanna be philanthropic and help the folks who are out there panhandling, encouraging them to not just hand money out the window, but actually make that financial contribution to organizations that are having a demonstrable positive impact on homelessness in Douglas County. So we have partnered with the county to provide the fund at no charge, we do not uh, charge a management fee or keep a, keep any types of fees in with this fund. So every dollar that's donated into the fund goes right back out into the granting pool for four organizations in Douglas County that serve the homeless community. As soon as that fund reaches $2,500, then the next quarter we make a distribution of $2,500. So since the start of this program, uh, the fund has collected just over $10,000 and we're ready today to make our fourth distribution to the Parker Task Force. So if anyone ever has any questions, let me know. But the beautiful part too is that as we have organically visitors that come to Douglas County Community Foundation's website and want to support what we do, they are all presented with the option of donating to various funds. One of them is the Douglas Has Heart Fund. So we receive both donations uh, through our website and checks mailed in. Um, one of the cool things for me is that we've received donations into the fund that have ranged from $10 all the way up to $1,000. And 
just if I could indulge one quick little story. Some of you guys have heard this. One of my favorite bragging points on the Heart Team and then also this, the Douglas Has Heart Fund is that uh, a few months ago, or, or I think it was about six months ago, I received, we received a donation online of $100. And immediately after that email came through to notify me that a donation was made, I received an email directly from the donor. And um, I'm not going to mention names because the donor asked me not to mention names, but this specific donor was someone who was contacted by the heart team, who was experiencing homelessness. And this individual, through the kindness and compassion of our heart team and the assistance of them, was able to find a job. And their, this person's $100 donation was out of their very first paycheck that they received from their new job and they wanted to give back. So it's a pretty cool story to have. So. Thanks, Jim. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. All the information about um, the Douglas Has Heart Fund, and I really have to give a big um, thank you to the Douglas County Community Foundation because you've been a wonderful partner in this, and it, it has been really very heartwarming to see the amount of generations or gen donations that have come in. So generous, generous donations, right? That's where I was going. Uh, Diane, would you like to come and share some information about? Parker Task Force, thank you for coming. Um, turn this on. There we, there we go. go. Okay, I'm, I forget I'm really short. Yeah. <laughs> Getting shorter. <laughs> um, I'm Diane Roth, and I've been a volunteer at the Parker Task Force since 2011. I think that's what my badge says here. No, 2005. I retired the second time at, when I, in 2011. I get my dates mixed up, apparently. Right. Um, but I feel very, very fortunate to be a volunteer and a board member at the Parker Task Force. It's an amazing organization, and it's in its 37th year of service. Our service area is Parker, Franktown, and Elizabeth, but if someone comes to our door from Castle Rock or from Aurora, um, we will not turn them away. We will help them on a, on a one-time basis and help them find resources closer to their home. Um, but anyway, we started as an all-volunteer organization, and we still are. There are no paychecks, so we can be very efficient with the contributions that are made. Um, and I think our founders really had a, a vision that we stick to today, and that is we're a short-term assistance agency. We believe it's our job to help identify resources and help people get back on, on their feet. There's kind of a mantra that our client advocates use, and that is come here for food and use your money for your bills. Um, and we, we, we have some success stories, and, and we have some that aren't success stories. Um, and, we're, and the community donates our, most of our food. We have eight food drives a year. Um, and then we raise money for uh, buying uh, non-perishables and, and, and other things. Um, but moving to homelessness, because I think that's what we're, we're here to, to talk about. Um, we believe it's our job to try to prevent help homelessness. And we provide some limited financial assistance for utility districts disconnections or perhaps helping with rent. But we can't always prevent homelessness and homelessness is, is part of our world today. So what I'd like to do is tell you something that happened yesterday. I was working in the front office and a young man came to the door and he was referred to us from Matt from the Heart Team. And um, he's homeless and he is working part time at uh, Sprouts Market in Parker hoping to become full time and living out of his car. Um, I was working in the front office, got his information, took him to meet with one of our client advocates, and they spent some time. And our client advocates, they try to help people figure out a plan, um, identify resources they can use. And after he met with um, Bernice, um, he went shopping and he got food and water in our market. And when he came out, he asked me, can I go back and talk to Bernice and thank her? And I said, absolutely, because she didn't have another client. So he went back to talk with her and thank, thank her. And after that conversation, she kind of ended it by saying, you are worthy. And he left with hope. And that was, it, it was really, it was really awesome. So that's what we try to do. That is wonderful. Thank you for sharing that story with us, and thank you for all the work that the Parker Task Force does. Um, definitely a valued partner for us, and I know somebody that, an organization that the Heart Team depends on for 
assistance when it's in in that area, right? We would love to do a picture and and do um, you know hand the check off for you. I know Mike has his big check, so <laughs> wonderful. Um, sorry, all one hundred volunteers at the Parker Task Force appreciate this. Yeah, wonderful. I, Commissioner Layden, I see your hand is up. Well, as you all are gathering for the photo, I, I just wanted to add a, a tremendous debt of thanks uh, to the Parker Task Force and specifically the Douglas County Community Foundation. Um, I, I think this, the secret sauce of this program around handouts don't help was encouraging people to redirect their generosity from street corners to the Community Foundation. And I think many of us were wondering, you know, whether or not that would work and would be a, a productive uh, program. And no doubt, I think what we're seeing today is an example of our citizens actually listening um, and donating to the Community Foundation. I, I realize Wendy later on may be talking about a, a potential um, QR code that we may be able to add to that sign for people to more easily donate. Um, but those donations just continue to go up. And anecdotally, in my travels, citizens tell me that, that panhandling is, is drying up. Um, and it, when it's not, I know that citizens know they can call the hard team. So just uh, wanted to share with you, I think that it's, it's working well. Uh, and this rubric, even though it may seem simple, is something that you know, I think regionally and throughout the state we could carry forward. Okay. I believe we are ready. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you so much again, Diane, for coming. And, and actually, big thank you to our generous donors that are, were, were able to help us make this happen. Um, OK, hey, Jen, so we before are. You move forward yes, too far. Well, I, I, I think it's always wonderful when we have uh, partners both in person and online joining us. I'm wondering if we could just go around the table there and online for uh, introductions. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Always a good reminder for me. So yes, let's go around the table. Um, Mike, you want to start us off? Mike Hill, Douglas County Health Department. Jason Gray, Town of Castle Rock Mayor. Mike Wade, Douglas County Community Foundation. Tiffany Marcito, Heart Team. Phil Domenico, Captain Highlands Ranch Division. San Castillo Jones uh, with the JBBS program at, at the Douglas County Sheriff's Office. Uh, Kirk Wilson, Lone Tree. Andrea Barnum, Workforce Programs Manager at Arapahoe Douglas Works. Good morning, Aaron White, Mana Resource Center. Hi, Dan Marlowe from the Help and Hope Center. Hello, everyone. Mike Paul Hemus, The Rock. Darren Weekly, Sheriff of Douglas County. 
Dan McKelkey, Department of Human Services. Jennifer Eby, uh, Department of Community Development. <laughs> you had to think where we were today, yeah. right? Uh, Wendy Holmes, Director of Communication and Public Affairs, Douglas County. Laura Hefta, Town of Parker, Council Member. Jeff Garcia, County Attorney. Ellie Reynolds, CEO of Douglas County Economic Development Corporation. Uh, are there any um, executive committee members online that would like to introduce themselves? Yes, uh, Bob Laguerre from Aurora representing Mayor Kaufman. Wonderful. Good morning, everyone. John. Good morning. Any others? Good morning. I'm Melissa Bortnam, I'm Clinical Director at All Health. Hi, it's Barbara Drake, Douglas County Administration. Good morning. Any others? Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining okay. us. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yes, welcome. And thank you uh, for doing those those quick introductions for us. I, I it's always good to, to have a good, strong group here. Um, we are going to jump around a little on our agenda today. Andrew? Oh, okay. <laughs> Sasha Easton is also here. She is the executive director for AD Works. Okay, thank you. Um, we're going to jump a little bit on the agenda and, and go to the summer point in time planning with Rand Clark. Allison, there we go. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Rand Clark from the Department of Community Development. Um, this summer, in July for the third summer row, we will be conducting a summer point in time count. A point in time count is an annual survey of those who are unhoused in our community. We do one every year in the winter on the last Monday night in January as required uh, federally and to support our continuum of care across the region uh, to survey those who are unhoused. And then for the last three summers, we have conducted one in the summertime here in Douglas County that we administer locally um, with our partners across the county to um, understand sort of the patterns and the changes between uh, the summertime and the wintertime and be able to track and assess the impact of our initiative. Last year in the summer of 2023, uh, we found a total of 54 who were unsheltered in Douglas County and 39 who were sheltered. So for those of you who might be new to the point in time, we really are looking at, at those who are unsheltered. That would be somebody living in their car, somebody living outside, um, somebody living in a, a parking lot in their vehicles. That's where we typically find folks in our community uh, through our HEART team. Those who are sheltered, those might be folks that are living in time-limited housing. Uh, we have a few transitional housing units that are accounted for um, through the point in time that are sheltered, but then also those that may be um, in a hotel living on a voucher uh, that is paid for by a nonprofit or an agency, so not paid for with their own funds. And so um, that's where we stood last year in 23. We do tend to see a little increase in the summertime as opposed to the wintertime. There's a slight increase. Um, and last year, most of our increase was felt in the number of, of cars um, that were parked where people were sleeping in their cars across our community. We saw a pretty significant jump last summer. And so uh, this year, we are planning to go back out in the month of July. Jen, if you could change that slide for me, please. Um, we will be out on the night of, there we go, July 29th, uh, 2024. So that's a Monday night. We'll have um, our four heart teams and a, a couple of staff out um, Monday evening. Uh, we'll be out early Tuesday morning, uh, most of the day on Tuesday, and then again on Wednesday morning. Uh, trying to contact those uh, who we know and those who we haven't yet met who are unhoused in our community. Uh, we'll be targeting things like um, parking lots, um, our outdoor spaces along some of our, our trails, um, some intersections, 
um, and some of our off ramps that might have folks who are um, hanging out there during the day and during the evening. We'll look at some of our transit centers um, that also uh, have, an, uh, we find a lot of folks kind of hanging out there at our housing centers. And we also do work with our community partners. So if somebody walks into the Parker Task Force um, and is unhoused, um, they'll help us fill out a survey. If somebody walks into Help and Hope or Catholic Charities or any one of a number of our partners, uh, we'll ask them that week to uh, fill out a survey and help us understand who in our community was unhoused on that Monday night, who they are, where they are, um, and what's happening. And then um, on, the, on Tuesday evening, uh, we'll have our uh, twice a year uh, semi-annual Strive to Thrive, which is a, a community outreach event for all who need assistance. Um, but it's a great opportunity for our nonprofit partners and community to come together to offer resources. And so as we're talking to someone who we encounter who is um, unsheltered or has, is facing housing instability, we have a say, hey, we'd like some information, but if you'd come on Tuesday, um, we can try and provide you with some additional assistance, connect you to our nonprofit community um, who is here to help, and, and much the way that Diane mentioned earlier, support those in our community who are in need. And so um, that is our plan uh, for the 29th. Um, we will be using this uh, this year to look at a couple of specific outcomes. So, Jen, if you want to switch that slide again to the next one. Um, we really will be looking at, at, from a data analysis standpoint, to really understand what those changes and trends are. Uh, we'll be comparing it to um, our last two summers and to see uh, what's happening in our community. We'll be looking at it to address the impact of, our, of this initiative, of our street outreach team and of the heart. Um, they uh, give us great reports every month on the impact they're having and what they're doing. And we want to see, this is a great chance sort of cumulatively to see um, the impact that they have and, and to, um, assess year over year those changes that we're seeing. Um, but you heard Commissioner Layden um, earlier reference uh, this idea that we want to head towards functional zero. And we know that that is a, a stated goal of this initiative and the work of our communities to get to that point of functional zero. And this year, we believe our summer point in time um, is going to be a really strategically important piece of getting to that functional zero. Um, getting to functional zero is, is a lot of work. It's a lot of effort by our partners, by our heart team, um, but also kind of behind the scenes. It requires quality data. Um, it's, we, it's not just a ideal zero, it's a functional zero where we can, we can track with data and with certainty, not just on an every summer basis, but we wanna get to a point where on a monthly basis through the work of the heart and our community partners that we can assess um, how we are moving towards and how we are getting close to and hopefully obtaining that functional zero here in our community. So that quality data, so that you all know, um, turns into a by name list. We've been doing this now with our veteran community uh, for almost a year. Uh, where every week and every month, in fact, this afternoon, we'll be meeting with a team from the VA where we discuss those who are unhoused in our community who are veterans. And we spend time talking about each of those individuals to ensure that they have the resources they need to become successfully housed if that's their choice. And so it's a great, great process that's been set up. And we plan to um, expand that to be able to offer this to everybody in our community, our families, our singles, everyone. Because ultimately, if we know by name who is in our community who is unhoused, we can then work to ensure that we have solutions in place for each of those individuals, the unique solution that's going to best fit their need. And so to get to functional zero, what does that require? It requires decreasing inflow. It's that, that rent assistance, helping our folks who are housed stay housed. Um, you've heard in the last few months, uh, Stephen's been sharing about our, our homeless diversion prevention work group and the work they're doing to do a homeless prevention pilot project. And it's the goal of keeping our residents unhoused. We want to keep them in their homes for them to not have to experience homelessness. Then it's also increasing our outflow. It's increasing the opportunities and availability and the solutions to get people to shelter and to housing. And so we're excited in this uh, next year to have the opportunity has been shared to uh, partner with the city of Aurora and some of our other surrounding counties to, uh, to stand up the regional navigation campus. Um, we are encouraged by folks you're gonna hear from today like step seven, we've heard from ready to work other programs across our community that can help people get to those shelter and housing resources. And then uh, just this morning, I uh, was talking with the Heart team about um, someone that we believe a, a deposit check was dropped. I'm giving you, a, uh, this is a preview, a deposit check uh, for somebody who in our community is unhoused, a deposit check that was dropped off by a church yesterday um, through our community service block grant funds. We're helping them stay in a hotel for about a week and hopefully early next week, they're going to move into an apartment here in Douglas County. Um, somebody who recently they've experienced homelessness but got a job um, at Amazon and is gonna be earning a living and going to be able to pay for their own home. And they just needed that support and that help of our heart team 
of our some of our uh, our block grant funds here at the county and some of our faith-based community their church is stepping up and writing a check for that security deposit um, and so really excited to be able to not just decrease those that that inflow but also to increase that outflow to have more opportunities for folks um, so that through um, our heart through our nonprofits we can help folks get into those shelter and housing solutions and so um, we are hopeful um, that come this summer, by the time we are completed with our, our summer point in time, that we'll be able to, um, we will be able to share with you that, that data and that information. We're hopeful that we can see that impact that we're having. Um, and as Commissioner Layton said earlier, that we are moving ever closer, if not really close, uh, to that functional zero here in our community. That's our goal and that's what we continue to strive for. So i um, happy to answer any questions. Uh, we appreciate the partnership with the Sheriff's Office to help um, you know, our heart team engage in this. Um, we'll also utilize a few other resources. Um, we appreciate the work of our community partners. It's a heavy lift. Uh, to do a point in time count over the course of, of the three days. So very much appreciative of all the support we get for this effort. So happy to take any questions um, or if there's any comments, uh, Jen can help facilitate those. Commissioner Layden, did you have any comments? Uh, primarily just a huge thanks to Rand. Obviously, uh, you know, the, the focus on that point in time is significant. I would add that, you know, part of the philosophy we had early on around uh, approaching the business community was really significant. I'm glad that um, Ellie Reynolds is with us. I know a big ask of the business community, particularly in, in my district in Lone Tree and Parker, where we have a lot of the high density and the big box stores, is to ensure that they have a trespass letter on file um, and that they're able to put up one of our uh, handouts don't help signs if they're interested. Um, Early on, we all said that, uh, you know, if they wanted something, they could reach out to us. Um, but what we actually um, have been thinking about is the heart team having copies of that um, handouts don't help sign with them um, as they travel. And maybe during some downtime, they could just put that up at the Lowe's or the King Supers if the manager or, or the corporation will allow that. Um, but then also having the trespass letters just in their vehicles. They can go up to the managers and then get those signed. I think that's probably a part of the big ask uh, of the hard teams is to proactively reach out to businesses. But I don't know, Ellie, if um, we have additional information around how we can reach the business community as we approach this, this point in time. Sorry, Commissioner, we were waiting for a mic to travel down to my side of the table. Um, yeah, I think uh, we can kind of explore how to get these out to the business community. I think it'd probably be good for our EDC to probably host a uh, panel discussion, maybe with some of the nonprofits and the private partners, because I think the, the missing link that's probably here is how does a public effort like this translate to the private sector and how do they utilize the resources and oftentimes they really don't know where to go or you know they they, see, they might see it outside I know that when people go to Park Meadows right they're seeing the signs but they might not know how to get access to it so I think we'd be happy to host something like that maybe frequently reminding them um, and then also how they utilize the resources is probably why you need the forum is so that it's not just resources available to them, but how they best utilize them to uh, serve their needs. So we can work on a forum at our EDC to do that. I, I think that'd be great. And we really appreciate that. And, you know, it, it's difficult owning a business, uh, large or small, um, you're preoccupied with inventory and hiring and human resources and all those issues associated with the business. It's, it's tough to add to that task list, list but I just wonder, um, is this notion of, and, and I'm thinking about, you know, Council Member Hefta too, you've done such a great job in Parker of um, reducing what we're seeing in terms of overnight parking at, you know, Walmart, Planet Fitness, some of the areas where it's, it's a little bit more prolific. But again, if the heart team can approach those businesses with the trespass letter and the signage, um, is that a help? Is that something that um, Ellie or Laura do? Is, is there something more we could do when we're thinking about this sort of 3.0 of the, of the heart team and the and that's done help campaign? Thank, thank you, Commissioner Layden. Um, yes, 
We have had some businesses in Parker decide to get the trespass letter in. I uh, haven't seen the sign yet, but I think the issue um, that you state is getting the word out and that one-on-one -on -one interaction with the businesses. So if the heart teams have that coffee, have a sit down, show them the letter, have the handouts don't help sign and offer them that assistance with a telephone number and an email, then that business can take their time to decide whether they wanna do that or not. But I do think it takes that personal touch because as we found out in Parker, another challenging issue is, is many of these business owners are difficult to reach. They live out of state, they own many businesses. And so we do need the heart team to try to keep after that as well, to try to track them down and offer these services even long distance through email and phone calls as well. So thank you, Commissioner Layden, and thank you as well, ma'am. Great, thank you guys. Also, Commissioner, oh, sorry, Commissioner Layden, I was just gonna say, this is Ellie. I think the, the big piece is probably missing is the buy-in into what we're doing and what the program is and that it's not just a sign, but really there's a much larger effort behind it. Um, and I think if we can get buy-in from that business community to say, hey, we're all better together if we put the signs, we're helping each other uh, and, and to maintain the quality of life that we expect in Douglas County um, and, and the reason that businesses continue to move to Douglas County. So I think we have to give them the why and the buy-in there for them to participate. You know, I, I really love that comment, um, specific to some of the site selection conferences that I know you've attended, we've all attended as part of the Douglas County EDC. The number one issue affecting the Denver metro area from a business perspective and site selection is homelessness, and, and site selectors have told us that. You know, as a fifth generation Coloradan that was born in Denver, I know that businesses really suffer when you have individuals that are loitering, urinating, defecating, putting signs up, harassing patrons right in front of the store. It's tough to make a dollar um, when you're, it's tough to make a dollar anyway, but even when you're, um, you know, encountering individuals that make it that much more difficult, if there's an opportunity um, to share that with the business community, I think that's the why in Douglas County and our commitment um, to just keeping their, their premises safe if they're interested in signing that trespass letter. And I would add on, Commissioner, um, I think the business community, another thing that re they're really looking for is resources that are not being taken away to solve this issue that doesn't solve it, but resources that have a plan and action plan behind it from the places in which they are locating and going to continue to plant roots. So I think that once again, getting that buy-in on the program and them feeling like their community is doing something about the issue versus taking resources away is really important. That's, that's a great point. Commissioner, this is uh, Wendy Holmes. I know you had an expectation that I would uh, address this topic. Is, is this the intended time to do so? Yeah, it may be, and I, I'll turn it back over to, to you and Jen um, with next steps, but I think that, you know, obviously okay. the work that you, you're doing, Wendy, is tremendous in this space. So okay. Please. There's really, um, from a strategic perspective, I think the opening comments from Commissioner Layden addressed, we're, we're doing a great job, collectively, collaboratively doing a great job in partnership with the community but can we do better? I think that's what's on the table. Can we do better? Can we raise more money? Can we continue to reduce the number of unhoused in our community? And so strategically through this communications campaign, we think there are two major calls to action. One is to get and keep more people to the table. Our large special districts, our nonprofits, our municipalities come, come to the table more frequently, help with communications more frequently. And the reason Ellie is here today is because the call to action is we think we can do better when we have the business community at the table, our EDCs and our chambers. Now, through that idea of the, the, the tactical idea, of let's have the heart 
have signage in their cars and trespass letter examples in their cars. What we should be doing is proactively reaching out to the businesses and saying, when you encounter someone and heart is there and you meet with them, you can count on them to have these resources. So they aren't surprised when you bring it up. Let them know they're going to have this conversation, this push-pull um, approach. And so we're, we'll do everything we can. The resources are already on the website, but we need that encouragement that this is a shared responsibility among us all. And then there's this idea of a QR code. And I know we were discouraged from doing that a year ago. There was concern about um, hacking and such. I don't know if law enforcement still has those concerns. Um, I, I see some nodding of heads. Um, do we need to make it easier for people to find the website? Well, people are finding it, we know that. But our measurable outcome, our objective was to redirect generosity. You might remember that from a year or so ago. And it's working, but can we do better? And those are the, those are the ideas that we think will get us there. And um, with that, Commissioner, um, I'll take any questions you have or anyone else has. I, I would just add um, a couple of things that, oh, oh, go ahead, Commissioner. Well, I, I just wanted to, to thank Wendy. Uh, I think she's done a phenomenal job and so much of this is dependent upon communications and the, the ability for our community and business par partners to understand what we're doing. And you've just done such a phenomenal job. So thank you for that. Yes, definitely. And I wanted to also add, I mean, I know that we've talked a lot about Hart being um, involved in this process and the, we do have a kind of business resource handout um, that we're in the process of developing. It, it largely mirrors what's available on the website um, to be able to kind of just reiterate that, but also have Hart have those kind of planning tools essentially with them when they're out meeting with businesses. So they will have that um, that has all the information. They do have access to the no trespass template letters from each of the different jurisdictions, um, as well as they have printed signs um, that we do have a, a link on our website that people can print, but it just seems like a good opportunity to have a sign to be able to hand to a business person when you're meeting with them right then. Um, and this is something that Hart, uh, you know, we have identified as a need and something that they would do when they're out doing kind of their proactive work. So meeting with, they have, each of our heart units have a um, area that they, they kind of are responsible for being the expert in and when they go out and do some of that proactive outreach um, in their area, they will go talk to the businesses in that area and, and do some of that work as well. So I'm expecting that. Um, that's definitely in the works right now. Uh, they have a lot of those resources with them now, and, and we're developing that brochure, so that, that will be a good thing. Um, in the meantime, I know that Dan and I um, are planning to present to the Douglas County EDC uh, in July, I believe. So that would give us an opportunity to at least kind of open the door about what the Homeless Initiative is doing, and I, I definitely would put a strong emphasis on the Douglas Has Heart Fund, um, how much has been collected, where that's been distributed, how those organizations are utilizing those funds, um, and what's available for the business community so that you know they understand that. But I love the idea of a forum. So I would, if if that is something that you know we could kind of circle back to maybe in the fall or something like that, in addition to the presentation we're going to do. Um, I think that would help us kind of keep that momentum going. And of course, we appreciate all the work that um, Wendy's team is doing to, to help us continue to get the word out. So anything else on this? The Dan McKelkey from Human Services. I would be curious from the business perspective of when they have a panhandler like at an entrance or an exit of, of, a, of their parking lot, what does that? Um, mean for them because you see all, all the people driving in and out wondering if they're going to give or not give or 
a panhandler in the shopping center of King Supers or, or something along those lines that makes people feel uncomfortable as they're coming out. You, you watch it, but you also as a store, as a business, don't want to be not compassionate to someone as well. It'd be interesting to hear from businesses of, of how they deal with that in particular. Yeah, I think, um, you know, as you were saying that, I, I'm trying to fit how uh, the EDC can really help. And I think what economic development does really well is it brings, once again, private and public partners together, but really large scale. Um, and so that's where I think a forum where you do have, you know, the sheriff's office there and you have uh, partners from maybe each municipality there talking about how it works best in their community. Um, I think that would create that buy-in and then people would utilize that resource kit that you're talking about. They'd know where to go to it. And when we talk about the, you know, kind of the, the donation side of it or the generosity side from the business community as well, I think they have to get that initial buy-in to be able to participate, to know what they're participating in. And so I think that the forum could help on all of those fronts. I think getting into the panhandling at their doorsteps, this is where I would really encourage, um, I think I'm really good at, at hosting maybe those larger forums, but ultimately to me, that seems like that is something that the chambers should really engage in. And I'm happy to circle up the wagons with the chambers on how they utilize that. But really we're talking about larger primary employers knowing that uh, resources are going to continue to stay with those employers and where their employees are, are kind of located versus chambers. I think they are dealing with small businesses that are short on resources. And so their cell is going to be different than an EDC cell. The chamber side of things should say, this is an additional resource that a small business can access and the county is making that available to you. So um, I'm happy to, to kind of take that on circling the wagons with the chambers and uh, figuring out where they plug those resources in. And I think another component to that, sorry, Sheriff Darren Weekly, um, is the large corporations that own these properties, the strip malls, and many of which don't live in Colorado um, and um, do not understand the, the dynamic of, of Douglas County and our population. And for them to understand and realize the potential ramifications of allowing or permitting overnight parking, camping, panhandling, uh, many of these corporations uh, don't care or don't don't want to engage with that sort of problem uh, again we live in a community that uh, we want to uh, connect these folks with services um, and ensure that um, that if necessary and we do have to uh, go to the enforcement side of things that they'll support uh, that enforcement because if they don't uh, law enforcement uh, does not have that ability so I think making those connections making sure that these corporations understand and the potential liability quite frankly that these corporations take on by uh, turning a blind eye any other comments yes I'm in. <clears throat> Ms. Kirk Wilson with Lone Tree so I do think um, you know, we've kind of touched on it, but the reality is, is most of our homeless population and, and um, the impact they have in Lone Tree, I'll just use Lone Tree as, as the example. These are large box store corporations that honestly, you can't really engage them on a, you know, just walking up to the store and, hey, can I talk to somebody? These are corporate policy decisions that are difficult to get them to make. Um, and so like, for instance, our Safeway, store right so we engage with the, the manager we try to reach out to the district manager um, and we've been fairly successful um, but to get them to put a sign up to get them to uh, have policies in place what we find is most of the time the management and or the employees are confused as to what they can and cannot do what they should call in what they shouldn't call in what they should do about a shoplifter not do about a shoplifter we've run into all sorts of very confusing um, things where, you know, you might have an employee say, well, I'll, the, the, my, my store policy is I can't call the police or my store policy is I shouldn't stop anybody. Uh, and then reality is you reach up beyond the local store you talk to and they're like, what, do you, what are they talking about? Why are they saying that's the policy? So, there's a, so I think the effort has to be bigger than just trying to talk to a local person 
most of our, and, and again, most of our issues are not with small businesses. They're with large corporate businesses that attract large numbers of people. That's what's attractive about panhandling there and being at those locations. So, um, so anyway, I, I think the effort to, to, to improve what we're doing um, is, is much more difficult than just, you know, knocking on a door and saying, hey, we, we have resources for you. It's going to be corporate level policy decisions that are sometimes and sometimes those are policy decisions are nationwide policy decisions right not just local uh, a local uh, policy so anyway i think that's what's so important so, about having so many of the local municipalities as part of it because i think what happens in lone tree and especially what is you know commercially in lone tree with park meadows is drastically different than castle rock and castle rock's effect to help their business especially with their main street so I think that's why you almost have to take a tactical approach to all of the business communities across Douglas County. Mayor Layden, I think yeah, I heard this you. is me. I'm I'm in my seat uh, at the United Gate in my plane. So <laughs> I, I'm hoping to hang in here as long as I can. But I, I heard the comment from the chief, and obviously the work of Lone Tree is phenomenal, and he's been at the tip of the spear on our team and this homeless initiative for a long time. So chief, we really appreciate you. I would say that's that's probably the reason we have Ellie Reynolds in the room. Um, you know, interacting with the heads of corporations is is not intimidating at all, and she does that often. I do that often. Safeway's headquartered in Greenwood Village. I went to law school with um, the guy who's in house counsel there. Um, these people, these these companies, are all at the end of the day individuals, and I, I think it's important as a county and as municipalities to set the stage. Uh, for who we are as a community and express to those corporations very clearly that we need to have uniform policies in place uh, to protect our citizens and our quality of life. So well taken. Um, I, you know, I think we take that as a challenge to reach out to those corporations. That are okay. Yeah, we, um, just to echo that we, we did um, with Chief Wilson um, gave us some contacts with Safeway and, and we went kind of uh, what I felt like was was to the right people to have those conversations. And I think we did run into a roadblock there. So re-engaging with them will be a, a good idea. Um, but we definitely did experience the fact that um, it's difficult for people at the local level to make those sorts of decisions. They don't feel empowered to do that. So. Yes, we'll we'll definitely have to reach out on many levels. Yeah, I'll just add one more thing. <clears throat> you know, we, we've had a lot of success with cleaning things up with management. So, you know, um, I think a year ago, you know, we had somebody living behind one of our big box stores, talk to the manager, and their reply was, well, I'm good with what they're doing. I, I don't want to do anything about that. Ultimately, the district manager was contacted and higher up and we got it cleaned up in a day, you know, of let's fig figure this out. Same thing happened at the smaller like gas stations and places where people were trying to camp. And mm. um, you talk to the, the, the person who's running the store and they don't want to do anything about it. You reach up a little bit higher and you can get those things pretty quickly taken care of. But it's cyclical. It's cyclical. You know, it's going to happen again. And we're going to have a new management team and a new. So it has to be ongoing constantly. And then you have to have good relationships with folks, I think, that are beyond the local person who might be running the store or what have you. So it's just an ongoing effort, I think. It certainly is, yes. Um, well, I- Jennifer, one more thing. Oh, one more I wanna, thing, okay, sorry. <laughs> I don't know if Commissioner Layden is still on, but you would expect me to say this, knowing me as you do. Um, there are thousands and thousands of businesses in Douglas County, if we could only get 200 of them, let's not set the bar so high and let, I, and I, I recognize what you say is true. I've been on the corporate side, I get that. But let's look at what we can do and maybe not set the bar too high, but maybe create a model for how we can be effective with large businesses and small businesses, start there, build from there, and be grateful for the accomplishments we can make, because I believe we can. Working with Ellie, working with the chambers, I'm, I'm optimistic. I just wanted to add that. Yeah, I would echo that. I just, I, I believe in the people 
that are in the room and online, I mean, you all are some of the best professionals in the state. And Chief, I, what Lone Tree is doing is, again, tip of the spear, and you, you are having a lot of success. So, so thank you for that. Um, I truly believe that if we have a, a concerted effort around this, we can identify an opportunity. And I, you know, I work in the private sector as well. Those businesses, they don't uh, necessarily enjoy having to interact with um, local elected leaders and law enforcement uh, or lawyers. And so when they, they hear from folks in the, in the government side, they might be listening more than we think they are. Um, and certainly that, that communication, I, I would expect to go up the chain fairly rapidly if they're being approached. Um, they may not always immediately agree, but I think through through committed ongoing conversation, we, we can probably move the needle and, and you all have. So thanks. Okay, thank you. Very good conversation along those lines. And I think some good next steps for us to follow up on. Thank you, Ellie. Thank you for being here and your input, everybody's input on this topic. That's, I think, going to um, allow us to kind of set that stage to, to move forward and, and see what we can do. So uh, any other questions or, or any other comments on the summer point in time planning? Rand has held stood in there for us. <laughs> throughout the conversation. Okay. All right. Well, then we are going to move on to our presentation from step seven. Um, and so I'm going to introduce uh, Michelle Porter, who is the director of development for step seven and Benjamin Drake, who is their housing director. So welcome. I will turn it over to you all. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Um, my name is Benjamin Drake. I'm actually the executive director of Step 7 Ministries. Um, and I guess before I get into it, I'd like to tell you a little story about how this ministry saved my life. Um, cool. That is our uh, vision statement there, to see men Christ-centered, set free from their addictions, and transformed into leaders. Um, as men, we are called to be leaders, providers, and protectors of our community, of our families, and uh, I can tell you firsthand that being an addict or addicted to drugs, placing that on a pedestal above everything else in your life really strips you of your man, if you want to put it that way. Um, so 14, I had a, had a drug addiction, 14-year drug addiction to meth um, right here in this county. Uh, I was not only selling it, but I was manufacturing it in a number of the counties surrounding. Um, I was in a very dark place doing unspeakable things with unspeakable people. And uh, with compounding felonies, I had, uh, I had reached the end. I was hopeless. I was ready to throw in the towel and give up. I stood in a courtroom, a county over in Elbert County, and uh, the judge said, uh, give me a reason not to send you to prison. I said, I don't have one. I'm so sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm, I'm okay with, you know, dying on the street or in some hotel bathroom with a needle in my arm. And he goes, you understand this is a 30 year prison sentence. You'll probably serve, you know, 88% of the time because it's aggravated with these compounding felonies through Douglas County, Arapaho County, Elbert County and Park County. And uh, again, I said, I just, I'm done. Uh, the sick and tired of being sick and tired is really something that that found uh, found home in my heart. You could say I was homeless, sure, but I was never on the streets, right? I was moving and grooving and I was hustling and I was doing what I could to stay off of the streets, either renting out hotels for months on end or setting up in people's houses and selling drugs for rent, right? It was a, it was a bad deal. And this is just a drop in the bucket of what comes to step seven. Standing in that courtroom, um, I was given the opportunity. The judge kind of gave me an opportunity he thought he wasn't going to see through. He said, you have two days, two days to find an approved program that the 18th judicial approves of, or uh, you're on the DRDC bus for your prison sentence. Two days in a county jail pod to find some sustainable traction uh, other than prison, I thought it was impossible. So I went back to the pod and I wrote my mom a goodbye letter. 
says, sorry for being a bad son. I'm sorry for, uh, you know, being a bad father. I have an 11 year old daughter now. Um, I'm sorry for our last name. Sorry for having it. You guys don't deserve a child like me. You guys are way better parents than this. And uh, I just said goodbye because I didn't think it was possible. She, uh, she writes back and my mom's just a trooper. She goes, uh, challenge accepted. There's too many people praying for you and our God is way bigger than this. And I said, all right, mom, you know, like that's mom. Um, so I go back to my, to my bunk after reading that email and I say, uh, one of those foxhole prayers, right? You know, Hey God, I don't know if you remember me. I'm kind of a mess up. Uh, if you can, uh, if you can get me out of this, I'll give you my life. If you can get me out of this, I will, I will devote everything I have to saving your children, to saving men that are in this position. I mean, it wasn't as elegant at that, but that was my heart, heart posture in the whole thing. And so I wake up the next morning. That's my, my little girl. As you can see, I was pretty far in my addiction there. And, uh, that was another big factor when I stood in that courtroom telling that judge I was done is my daughter was probably better off without me, right? I was so many times in jail right here in Douglas County making a phone call to tell my, my little girl happy birthday. And I have a five-year-old daughter that's asking me, why, where are you, daddy? Why aren't you home? Why aren't you with me? And I said, because daddy's sick right now. And in my, in my heart and in the back of my, my head, I said, how could you do that? How could you pick a substance over a precious little girl like that? But that is the grip and the impact that drugs and alcohol can have on an individual, right? It can just strip you of everything that was important in your life. And you place that up on a pedestal above of everything, but friends, family, God, responsibilities, everything. Um, so fast forward back to that, uh, back to that moment there in jail. Sorry. Um, I wake up the next morning and I go to the kiosk and I open up an email and it says, Hey, good morning, son. You have a phone interview with step seven ministries at three. And I said, mom, it doesn't work like that. You can't just like hit up the jail and be like, Hey, my son's in there and he's got a visit from this guy. You know, if he could use the, the public telephone, that'd be great. And so I said, okay, mom, I don't know how this is going to work, but uh, thank you for trying. 245, 255 rolls around and the buzzer hits from the tower. Mr. Drake, you have a personal phone call. Are you kidding me? Like, all right. So I walk downstairs and the guard spins his personal phone around and gives it to me and says they're on the phone for you. So I sit down and I talked to the executive director at that time and he said, uh, he said, tell me a little bit about you. So I gave him the rundown, thinking that uh, I might be too bad for the program, thinking that he hasn't heard any of this before. And his response was perfect. Sound like an eligible candidate for this program. And uh, we'd love to have you. The guys at the Motzenbacher house are, are ready to accept you and uh, we can get you here on Thursday. Uh, okay. And so he said, get in front of the judge, tell him you've been accepted and I'll do the rest on my end. So I hang up the phone and I look at the CEO and I go, I think I need to call my lawyer. And he's like, yeah, because it transcripts on their screen, what you're talking about to monitor it. He goes, yeah, it sounds like, uh, you got a once in a million chance right here. Hopefully I don't see you back. And I was like, man. So, uh, a day later, I'm standing in front of the same judge who gave me that kind of two day ultimatum there. And he was floored. He had to stand by his word and he had to stand by what he was uh, offering, but he was really, really taken back that uh, this could, you know, materialize or turn into fruit so quickly. Um, so then I was walking out of there. I, uh, I got in a car, I got to the Motzenbacher house that's over here in Clark Farms and Parker. And, um, <laughs> The guys were all standing outside ready to accept me. And these guys were, they were nothing like I expected, right? I was thinking of a lockdown facility, turning your phone, turning this, turning that. I'll tell you when to eat, sleep, and breathe, and we'll get you sober, you know? And it was definitely the, the contrary. 
they're outside mowing and sweeping up leaves and and uh, just taking care of the house. And they said, oh, hey, Ben, how are you? I said, how do you know my name? I said, I'm so glad you're here. And just let you know, uh, we will love you until you can figure out how to love yourself. I said, bro, don't talk to me like that. Like, who, who are you? You know, like so many years of my life, I could never trust anybody. I was always looking over my shoulder. It was what I was going to get out of it, how I was going to progress rather than than thinking of any sort of wholeness at all. So I got put into uh, into the room upstairs and I, I said, man, this is this is kind of like my mom's house. This is pretty nice. You know, like this isn't a facility. This is uh, a single room, single bed. Every, every man gets his own room kind of thing. And I have my personal space and they let me shut the door and all kinds of stuff. And so, uh, you know, fast forward a little bit. I, uh, I got healthy, right? Uh, I went from 120 pounds. Every time that I get checked into jail, they'd put me on what they call the insure diet. It was a diet that I get an insure in the morning and an insure at night because they were afraid that, you know, with my low body weight, my organs might start shutting down or I might start rejecting food um, to, to starting a fitness group for the men in the program. Um, I just recently, well, a year ago, I went on a missions trip to Africa. I got to uh, spread step seven recovery groups to Uganda, one of the drunkest nations in the world. And uh, the big problem there is that they have no recovery place. Right. They have no means of a facility or anything to give these people recovery. A lot of them brew their own alcohol, sell drugs to just feed the family. And I get that. I understand that desperateness and that posture in it. But uh, we're a very capable nation, right? We have the means to probably help in that avenue. So we went over there and now there is nine small groups in remote villages serving 500 people, uh, turning, you know, helping them turn a life of, of addiction into a life of production. Uh, micro businesses are getting started, empowerment, you know, all the things that uh, these people thought they'd never have, all these things that I thought I would never have. Um, so. That is kind of my story in a nutshell. I fast forward through that, became a, became a house leader, and I found a real divine purpose to serve. I had been given a second chance. Well, you can call it like the 14th chance, but um, definitely given a chance to really do good and get some traction underneath me, and I was not going to save it to myself. I was not going to hoard that. Everything I do is in a posture to help the men in the same struggle get through that fire because there is a pr productive and healthy life on the other side of it. An identity that we don't have to find in drugs and alcohol or self-destruction, um, an identity of strength and power and, and leadership, really, right? Um, you know, I, I speak from a position of, of running men, right? Men our leaders. Again, a provider, a protector for the family. They are supposed to be the go-between between between their kids and their wife and, and the struggles of the world. And if you want to move it farther up the line, it is the same way, you know, history is written that, that men went to go fight the wars, why, why women took care of the country, right? And that's the same posture that we, we take as a biblical leader. We're supposed to be that, that force that stands between the, the evil side of the world and, and the good side. Being able to shoulder the burdens, being able to, to do all this with a productive and healthy lifestyle. Um, so to go back to the ministry, that was, uh, so I'm three and a half years sober, right? Um, well, three, three years, seven months sober, coming up on four years, which is pretty cool. I never thought that would ever be possible in my life. And the only time that I ever had sobriety was when I was state assisted and, you know, sitting in a jail cell. But I got to tell you, like, I would spend a year, I'd spend a year and a half in, in jail and I'd come out and the first thing I would do stepping out into that parking lot is use. 
it was a horrible thing. It was a horrible cycle and it happens all the time because there is, there's time to think about your actions, sure. But if you lack the, the self-discipline and the, and the real understanding that, you know, how critical life is, portion of it, there's no traction. You just, man, I haven't used in a year. All right. You know, I haven't smoked a cigarette in a year. All right. I'm finally free. Let's go do this, you know, or, hey, I've been sitting down for so long. There's so much money I've missed out on. There's so many things I've missed out on. Let's go harder. Let's get a little bit smarter in how I'm doing this so I won't get caught kind of thing. And that's where step seven really shines is building a sustainable life outside of drugs and alcohol. Something that you are putting brick by brick every day in place saying, I don't support a life of using. I don't even want to go do that because I have this that I've worked so hard to build. Why would I throw all that away? That's a perfect model. Yes, there's relapses. Yes, there's tragedy and death in the ministry from, from overdose. But the percentage is so high of the men that come in. Um, we just did some very basic number crunching, right? So please don't hold me to this exact. But it's like 82% of the men that come into the program do not reoffend. And uh, that alone speaks volumes to, to our program, to the sustainable life that is created through these homes. Um, step seven is a faith-based, so I'm going to kind of switch gears here. Step seven is a faith-based sober living community in Douglas County and Elbert County. We have seven sober living homes. Um, our homes are a little bit different than most sober livings. Um, they like to warehouse men. And I understand that there is a time and a place possibly for that, but I have done enough time in a concrete box with three other individuals to know that that is a very hard model to be able to build any sort of self-discipline and self kind of motivation because someone's always in your space. When getting sober, one of the biggest things that, uh, that I had to deal with and a lot of these guys deal with is being alone with your own thoughts. Right. I've done some unspeakable things to people that never deserved it. Right. And I have to shoulder that. I have to be able to sit alone and be able to process these things and not go use because of the shame, because of the guilt that I have. And processing that comes from a personal space and also a relationship, not only with the men in your home, but with Jesus. Um, so each man gets his own room. Each man is responsible for paying his share of the rent. Rent. We keep the rent as low as physically possible or economically possible. Um, rent is eight fifty a month, right? That gets you uh, rent paid for the house. It's not just renting a room. You are contributing into the, the rental of that property. Uh, Michelle will go into some of the inner workings of the home and how that kind of plays out demographically, but... Um, it gives them a good posture in being able to self-sustain now, right? I have rent to pay. I have a phone bill to pay. I have all these things to pay. You know, I'm actually a person because for so many years while I was, you know, running and gunning, I didn't have any responsibilities. The only responsibility I had was sell enough drugs to make enough money to be able to, you know, set up for a week or, you know, pay this track phone that I had, it was nothing sustainable, nothing normal. Um, along with being sober, one of the major requirements for men in the ministry is to find and maintain full-time employment, right? So that is a big thing too. We are not a lockdown facility. We are not a facility that will tell you when to eat, sleep, and breathe. But we are um, a program that puts critical life skills critical life skill training, right? Um, when, when we first walk in, we are rough, right? We are super rough, but it quickly gets traction. Six months, eight months in, now guys are always on time. Guys are, you know, paying rent early or on time because of the, the motivation of failure, right? They have failed for so long in our lives and now we have a chance to shine and it, 
it's going to work. It's feeling good. It's feeling like a productive member of society. People don't look at you like that outsider or that, you know, oh man, watch out for that guy. You know, let's walk around him on the street or, you know, stuff like that. You are actually like a person. And um, so the job aspect of it's very critical. One, for all those reasons I just mentioned, but two, what are we going to do when we're done, right? When we're done with this sober living, when we're done with this program, what are, what are we doing, right? What's the next step? Most of them have families, right? And this is kind of last ditch effort. Wife kicks them out, says you got to go do something. Um, we'll stay married or, you know, softly separated until you can start being productive in your sobriety and the family and all these things. Um, and the other ones, you know, the other, you know, percentage of uh, our population come from the streets, right? And uh, it's definitely kind of a different homelessness, right? We have cars, we have parking lots that people stay in, like you guys were just talking about. And it's not so much the homeless we think is is a tent on the side of Denver or on the sidewalk, right? It's It's a really kind of almost a demographic that you kind of overlook, right? Because it's not so much in your face. We have, uh, but we do take a, a number of guys that have come straight from Denver off the streets or somewhere else in a different state on the streets and hopped trains and did all kinds of crazy stuff to get to Colorado and then got stuck. We, we helped those two. Uh, quick story, we had a guy, um, he's currently working at the, the AMC in Parker. Uh, he's a wonderful man. We picked him up from uh, Denver Cares, super rough detox facility down in Denver. As far as rough, I mean, very institutionalized. Uh, it's a, it's not a good place to go. I mean, it's a good place to go, but it's not, it's not fun um, by any means. It's not like the sandals of it all. Um, he hadn't had his own room for thirty years. He hadn't had a roof over his head for fifteen, and the only place that he could stay. He would stay on a couch and they would force him to sell drugs for rent. It was crazy because I was on the other side of that. I had facilitated that so many times. I, yeah, I'm going to stay in my house. You got to move this. And here I am walking this guy into his room and he's in tears and he's thanking me. And he's, he's just so, he's shaking. He's so happy. And he tells me exactly what I had done to people. Again, shouldering whatever we did in our past appropriately. Well, the only thing I can do is move forward, right? The only thing I can do is make a difference now here today. And this is what I'm doing for you. This is what this ministry is doing for you. Excuse me, I removed myself. This is what this ministry is doing for you. Giving you sustainability, giving you a room. You don't have to sleep in the rain. And he has been a star of the ministry. He mows people's yards. He's way over friendly with the neighbors. Um, <laughs> he works at the, the movie theater and he's just, uh, he's just Keith. And it is so awesome to see a man in that position come into a house and be so grateful and take advantage of it, you know? Um, so the job aspect there, we have a three pillar foundation for our ministry. We have recovery based small groups, we have sober living homes, and we have a recovery-based church service. Kind of in a comprehensive approach, providing men in our program the necessary tools for... Um, Mr. Drake. Yeah. Um, I, first of all, thank you so much for sharing all that you have shared. Um, we, we do have just a few more minutes. Oh, um, I'm and sorry. We, that's okay. Um, and we, we do have um, some other areas we need to get to. Okay. So. Um, I know you probably have some closing um, comments, but I do want to share with you, Commissioner Layden, um, his plane did take off, um, but he wanted me to share with you, um, Mr. Drake, this is the reason we are here doing this important work. We are deeply grateful to you for sharing your journey. Keep up the great work and know that Douglas County is behind you. Oh, man, thank um, you. We so appreciate the, all the work that Step 7 is doing. And I know I, I'm, I have a big um, thank you uh, to uh, Laura Hefta for, for yes. 
making this connection Super for us and, and to um, be able to connect with a, a local uh, group that is doing such amazing work. So we want to keep that line of communication going. Um, Michelle, uh, or I'm sorry, you know, I didn't any mean other? To take no, you're months. fine. We, we so appreciate hearing these stories. <laughs> Michelle, any other comments? Thank um, you, Mr. Drake. No, just thank you for having us here. We do have some additional paperwork that tells a little bit more about step seven. Mm -hmm. um, we are projected to open 10 homes uh, by the end of this year, and we just appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful work that you all are doing and, and for coming and sharing your story with us, Mr. Drake. That that It's very inspirational. That's that is why we're doing the work we're doing. So um, we want to continue to be a partner with you and, and we appreciate um, your participation today. Any other comments? Hi, this is District Attorney. <laughs> He's our Tyler. mascot. Step seven has been a, a multiple grant recipient from Douglas County Community Foundation. I've had the honor and privilege of meeting with both of them individually in your own lives. If you're ever looking for a great organization that's local, that's making a demonstrable impact, they are fantastic. So just wanted to share that. Thanks, Mike. Thank you so much. We appreciate your support. Oh, thank you, Michelle. We, we appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jennifer. Yes. Um, yes. I had the privilege and opportunity to both honor and tour the Porker Task Force and uh, connect with Diane Roth and her team several years ago. I also had the privilege and opportunity to honor Step 7. Both were recognized formally by myself and the mayor of the town of Parker in a certificate of recognition for their outstanding work for our community. And I have to say that Step 7 home is beautiful and they are vital to the neighbors and their community, very helpful. And Diane Roth, thank you so much for working so hard for so many years. We truly appreciate you. Absolutely. We thank would you. also like to invite anyone that would like to come into our facilities or our home to check them out, to just let us know and we'll set up that tour. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. What is nice meeting the two, seeing the two of you again and having the chance to introduce step seven. Thank you. Any Thank other you so comments, questions? Okay. Okay. Um, okay, we're gonna go for a very quick heart update. Um, and I know we do have some um, public comments we're gonna get to, so go ahead, Tiffany. Yeah, um, I will start with my success story um, while the slides are coming up. Um, one of our newer navigators, Kim Alvarado, and Sheriff's Deputy Brad Schramm uh, met with a male a couple weeks ago who was pulled over by patrol who had expired registration. Um, the male had been living out of his vehicle, trying to apply for jobs, um, but really having that barrier of um, not wanting to drive his vehicle around when it was expired, um, hence the uh, being pulled over by patrol. Um, so the unit responded and assessed his needs found out that the most pressing need was getting his car registered. A faith-based organization uh, pulled through for the team and registered, paid for the registration. Um, it was a week later, uh, he reached out to the navigator and let them know that he was able to make his job interviews. Uh, and he actually started his job yesterday. So that was wonderful, um, hoping to get his first night or his couple paychecks to be able to get an apartment on his own, but he was very thankful for the team and the, the faith-based organization for that registration payment. Next slide, please. So last month we had a total of 191 calls. 24% of those were dispatched by law enforcement. We had 8% public referrals, 14% citizen calls, and 9% community partner referrals. And during our downtime, we do the proactive street outreach. So we are going around into the community behind businesses and um, supermarkets. We're on the trails, on our bikes, now that it's nice outside. Um, so 45% of our efforts are doing proactive street outreach. Next slide. So of the calls that we are getting, we provided seven with just um, general information uh, if, a grandmother called and wanted to know where a local shelter was for their um, 
for their grandson, so on and so forth. 62 individuals were contacted by heart. Eight were not from Douglas County. 14 were uh, ended up not being homeless. 12 refused services. Four had some sort of law enforcement action, whether that was arrested on a warrant or given a trespass citation, anything like that. 82, uh, no unsheltered person was found. I contribute that to our outreach efforts. So if we're going around to the RTD stations and we don't find anyone, um, we mark that as a no person found. And two, we had unoccupied camps that have been since cleaned up since this report. And the heart services that were provided last month, we had five individuals giving housing support, 66 uh, were given motel vouchers, 22 individuals were given assistance with transportation, whether that means uh, they were given a ride or a gas, um, they needed their gas tank filled up, a bus pass, anything like that. And two were referred to a shelter of their choosing. Next slide. And here are the calls that came in by location. Majority of last month we received um, from Highlands Ranch, 37%, 17% from Parker, 23% Castle Rock, 5% Englewood, and uh, Lone Tree, 14%, and then Castle Pines, just 3%. So yeah, that's what I have to report today. I'm just really trying to incorporate those outreach efforts ahead of the point in time to make sure that we are contacting as many individuals as possible um, to make sure that they are, get connected to the appropriate resource. Thanks, Tiffany. Any questions for Tiffany? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, what... Sorry. Uh, what makes Highlands Ranch the highest percentage that you're getting the calls from? We've seen a lot of individuals at the bus stops, specifically near town center. Um, we've actually gotten a lot of calls of a panhandler at the King Supers off of University and Highlands Ranch Parkway that we're really trying to work for, with the businesses and the, um, the owner of the parking lot. It's uh, really hard to get a hold of some of those corporate um, entities as Chief Wilson was talking about. Um, so our deputies have been really trying to work hard at getting connected to those um, corporate individuals to possibly put no trespassing signs or sign no trespassing letters. Um, so we've gotten a, a, a lot of calls for a specific individual that we're trying to address. Um, unfortunately, that individual is not homeless. They're not from Douglas County. They just come down here and panhandle for money. Um, so that's mostly where we're getting all of our calls, town center area and the King Supers off university. I think that's something I can help uh connect with I think maybe outside of just the business owner or that supermarket mm -hmm. I think that's something we should probably go to the developer of that space who still is owning a lot of that commercial land yeah. um, to get that in road there okay thank you yeah that would be great I'm sure that would be helpful very helpful for the heart team as well yes yeah thank you um, anyone else Okay, we are going to move quickly to, I know we are running behind today, um, but some wonderful good information and discussions today as well. So we're going to do a, a very quick executive committee member update. I know I do want to allow um, San to provide a, a quick introduction. Um, she is uh, filling the role of um, overseeing, I know, the reintegration officer um, who is Deputy Sanchez, who has been here with us quite a bit. Um, do you want to do a quick introduction? Everyone, this is such an honor to be part of this group. Um, I am the new uh, JBBS programs administrator. My name is San Castillo Jones. Um, I've actually, let's see. I'm new as of last week, but I've been with the agency almost 10 years. So I'm looking forward to collaborating with everyone. Do we have any other executive committee updates today? Yes, Laura Hefta, Town of Parker Council Member. Um, I'm happy to report that we've had um, our Police officers have worked with Heart Team for some cleanups um, on an HOA property that they identified in the town of Parker. We also have a few local gentlemen who do not want any resources 
um, as offered by the heart team and our police officers are in constant contact with them. Um, Joe Dagenhart is on the heart team and if I could give him a second for a Zoom update, he can tell us about a few other matters. Joe, are you on Zoom? That's okay. Uh, the police chief, Jim Serapis, tells us that Joe is the representative for the police department on there. And so the chief has given me the, the only updates which I've just talked to you about. Joe would just add a little bit more information. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, any other comments, updates? Okay. So I'm not, I'm not seeing any here in the room. Um, any others online? Okay, uh, hearing none, I'm going to uh, move us on to the public comment portion. Uh, I know that we do have Rich who is signed up for public comment. Would you like to come up to the podium, Rich? Do we have a timer or something? Or? Oh, okay. Timer will show or something? Um, or you'll just cut me off. I think we do have one. I'll, I'll, I, I, you have three minutes. <laughs> okay, I'll just read this, and if there's more time that I can talk a little bit, just let me know. Sure. Okay. Houseless, homeless, roof over thy head issue, 760-681-4926. 760-681-4926. Call me to start an actual, direly needed coalition to stop this absurd and ever-increasing madness from government and much of the community, if and only if you have a working conscience, not just lip service, not just lip service of how good, right, caring you are, but in fact live and let live in your actions, more importantly, in your inactions to strangers, to strangers let's legalize legalize a euthanasia pill a euthanasia pill a euthanasia pill that allows the mature brick and mortar houseless adults to leave this abject nightmare they face in your town this state this country peacefully loving lovingly painlessly with family and friends all around to finally release them from the sheer ignorance, shameless hypocrisy, utter void of actual decency, respect, and a simple letting people take care of themselves in the way they see fit. In our quote, deep spirituality, superiority, virtuousness we tenaciously claim to be let's just your words not mine let's just once and for all get rid of this scourge the lazy the bums the drug addicts the mentally disturbed the eyesores the property value depreciators the vagrants the do-nothings the perverts the leeches and the parasites by allowing them to be done with this mentality of monstrous evil masquerading as all good, right, and the American way. You too, please. Stanford professor Dr. Robert Sapolsky, his book, Determined, for steeply researched academic condemn condemnation of this mentality. Okay, do I have a second more or? Yeah, 13. Oh, I have 12 seconds. <laughs> the stigma needs to be taken off people living in their vehicles. They're first class citizens. We need to leave people alone. Thank you. Thank you for your public comments. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, do we have any other public comments in the room? Okay, and my understanding is we have no online comments. Um, 
I just want to thank everybody for being here. Um, we have a lot of good information that was shared today. I think it's, it's always good to hear all sides of the story, right? And to hear all about the good work that is being done in the community. Um, I, th I just want to thank you all for being here with us and continuing to uh, engage in this conversation with us. I think um, we, that's what we need to, to continue to move forward, right? So thank you very much. Uh, and we will see you next for the next meeting, which is on July 11th. Thank you.